Welcome back to Perp Plays, a video series where we go behind the scenes of some of your favorite games. Today we're delighted to be joined by the team at Maze Theory as we take a closer look at Doctor Who, The Edge of Time. Please be aware there will be spoilers for the opening chapters of the game in the audio commentary and the video displaying on screen. Enjoy. Hello, my name is Marcus Moresby and I'm the creative director on Doctor Who The Edge of Time. I'm going to introduce you to my fellow colleagues. So, Joey, if you want to introduce yourself. Yep. Uh, hi, my name's Joey Ito. Uh, I was lead design on Doctor Who. Uh, and then I'm going to introduce you to Adil. Hi, guys. I'm Adil. Um, I was narrative designer on Doctor Who. I like the way this actually has similarities to Half-Life Alex in the, the rocks fading off to... Uh, but you created that before half of it was even a thing. <laughs> Obviously, yeah. Great minds. But I do remember you was making this one. It's like almost like last minute. It's like trying to put things together, and then it kind of like <laughs> stuck in place. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. It was, no, it was always pre-planned. I meant to do that from the beginning. So right now it's going to be loading the start of the game, which is in the laundrette. I remember when I first joined uh, back in I can't remember October twenty. What was it eighteen? I can't remember which year it was. Um, this was the first era that was mostly blocked out. Um, and it kind of gave me like a taste of how things were going to go forward. And then I remember just saying, all right, Joey, now you have to make puzzles in this room. And then I was like, kind of, okay, I had to sit down, try to create ideas. But one of the main goals I remember Marcus telling me was just make sure you can open the dryers. Definitely. <laughs> I mean, for me, from a sort of story perspective, um, it's something in Doctor Who that is quite common having a everyday environment um, thing, stories happening somewhere normal and everyday before they go off on a long journey into the weird and wonderful there was also so many plans that we wanted to do with the change machine I mean we've got most of it in um, but of course given time it would have been great to use a bit more of the change machine or what you do with the soap dispenser but at least you can play with the soap you know dispenser and throw things around yeah, definitely. Uh, there's a few th like Easter eggs in here. Um, these pictures um, on the walls themselves, um, they are predicting what's going on later in the game. Th these are my two cats. Oh, uh, that's my cat. Willow. <laughs> <laughs> and it's lucky. <laughs> Got to get your cats in the game. Uh, yeah, they, so those two pictures on the wall actually are uh, premonitions of future in parts of your journey that you're going to go on. Do we still have that car? No. Okay. Yeah, the car was taken <laughs> so out. There was, a Easter, <laughs> there was an Easter egg that, yeah, uh, when you looked outside, there was a car driving by. <laughs> yeah, it was a little bit uh, deaf art, wasn't it? It was. <laughs> nah, it's a go. Uh, this laundrette's actually based off the Barbican laundrette uh, for laundrette fans. <laughs> Joey, do you remember how many salt boxes you could stack up before um, they started oh, disappearing? Oh, um... I think it was about six, wasn't it? You you had the record beat me by one. Yeah. I can't remember what it was though. <laughs> I spent a lot of time. I did equal it on the quest. <laughs> that doesn't. You spent too much time <laughs> up there doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's going into. If you actually do read those bits, there, there are uh, the text on that is relevant to the game. That's a little cheeky, cheeky nod to the story. Uh, those are less so. Oh, I remember that. So I did create a mechanic. Uh, one of the first things was where you can flip open the book. Mm. It's a shame we couldn't get that in, but that would have mean more art. Exactly. <laughs> and we were developing for every platform. All it once. was. And did you ever look at the dustbin? That used to be interactive, wasn't it? It did. Um, uh, still can, I think. <clears throat> no, it was uh, taken out. So it's a Coal Hill School for the Doctor Who fans obviously know where Coal, school, uh, Coal Hill School is That's uh, it was in the very first episode and future episodes I suppose um, that is a, my local feral cat who <laughs> visits me there's a lot of cats in the beginning of this game we're all cat lovers so they also need to get a cat soon soon after the after the lockdown <laughs> This one, I remember um, trying to get the audio sounding like it's coming from the phone was quite difficult at the time. I think we did okay. But I remember, yeah, that was quite challenging. You think it's quite simple, but actually getting the audio sounding right um, is quite tough.
sorry about this. You're the only one who can help me save the universe. And oh yeah. So they're just ready for a first time glitch. Do you remember that bug that right before the time glitch, someone could run <clears throat> to the, uh, towards the doors and get kicked out of the laundrette? <laughs> <laughs> you fix all those bugs, right? <laughs> yeah, that was collateral. Yeah, you can't Such do a it. headache. <laughs> cool. Right, so this is us in our first future environment. So this is, I don't know how many years this is supposed to be in the future, but um, after certain monsters have invaded the Earth. I can't remember if it did uh, join the team well, yet or not, but I remember Marcus had to spend a good week or two creating the Hydrox, um, and then he was he said he had needed some private time and then created in VR. Oh yeah, you had, a, you had another version that had arms, can you remember? Yes. Oh, I missed that. So the original, yeah, the early models were created in Oculus, was it Oculus Medium? Sculpted in that, and then re-topologized. Um, so that was quite fun in itself. Just I mean, did like you think it was good? Was it a good experience? Yeah, it's good for sketching. Um, the, the final meshes are a bit heavy, so you have to do a bit of work to mm. redesign them. But for trying stuff out, it's great fun. <laughs> so that was the first jump scare uh, horror moment that I put in. I thought I'm going to put a bit of Joey in this game. And I remember this was the first one I did. And Neil, the lead programmer, uh, I remember him getting freaked out, and I thought, okay, if it freaks him out, it should work on everyone else. And it did. <laughs> it's been a while since I've seen like, this. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's, like, it's been quite a while, hasn't it? Yeah. Since yeah. going back to this and seeing things. Well, I'm it's used to the Quest version. <laughs> And that was quite a lot of work to get this running on Oculus Quest. Uh, there's a bit of story in there about staying indoors, which is all quite appropriate now. <laughs> Due to an unknown threat. Okay. So that was one of the interesting things. I um, just saw, took a glimpse of like the hot steam coming out. I remember when I first put it in as a test, it was like blowing over the fuse box area. And one thing that didn't occur to me was people straight away thought they couldn't touch the fuse box because they thought the steam would burn their hands, uh, mm -hmm. even though that wasn't the case. Uh, so that was one of the things I thought, you know what, I'm just going to tweak it. But it's, it is quite you know, funny how things turn out. Yeah, this section was completed before I joined the team. I remember playing this the yeah, first this couple is, of days. This was the first part uh, we created our vertical slice on. The puzzles have changed, and um, so this is the second variation where we thought we need to make it more difficult. a little present in the safe for you. But before you ask, I can't send anything else. Not from here. So the first anyway, one, if I remember right, um, the code was just written on a piece of paper, locked away in a desk. Yeah, on the back of the notepad. Yeah. So also the idea in here, the story is to do with the launch at manager. Um, he was hiding out here. He was also a bit of a conspiracy theorist. He, he was, uh, he'd heard of a mysterious box appearing randomly and fading in and out in, in the local area. Um, so there are various photos of him trying to capture that. Uh, the books all have various names. So you, Joey. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. I'm such a good writer. Look at this. The biggest book that's there. That's Ian. <laughs> uh, fun making those clocks. I always wondered, Marcus. Do you know the old the old man, the laundrette manager? Mm -hmm. Who is that? The picture. Ah, there is. Uh, that is something that might be uh, there might be a bit more to that than we think oh hello sweetie it's a nice little reference to uh, River the River from, from the show so did you take all these photos yourself? oh yeah <laughs> well a lot of them actually are uh, weirdly they're places I grew up in uh, some of them are in Hatfield in Hertfordshire uh, various photos in London Actually, quite a few of them are East End of London, which actually relates to where you are in the game at this point. 
Something there for the fans with he's written those notes. Mm, our first moment of the Sonic. Oh yeah, I had a bit of trouble because I was facing the wrong way because I've got a really <laughs> weird VR setup at home. <laughs> there you go. Oh, I love my Sonic screwdriver. So don't I mean, that feeling when people always say it's the first time to get the Sonic screwdriver is always brilliant or amazing. Super handy, that. Grab the Sonic, then. Word of warning, the Hydrox are on the verge of breaking out, so you better get a move on. You need to unlock the door using the Sonic. Is that still Hatfield? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's my local sweet shop, that one. Uh, then sort of plotting the photos into the local map of the area. The old conspiracy theorist. Maybe they were 5G masts. Who knows, maybe there'll be more into that story later. Yeah, exactly. This is uh, what we call the Pac-Man lock internally. For reasons. Yeah, they were great fun to design. Originally they had more discs, didn't they? Um, yeah, they did. But it was just trying to get it working on all VR. It was also this was quite tricky. one of the first levels that we wanted to make sure we introduce players easier. Yeah, effectively this section is a tutorial for movement interaction, um, a little bit of puzzle um, for sort of getting started in the main game. Do they do? Can you remember what the Easter egg is here? The Easter egg? Once we fans would know. Like the area. I like this would know. What, what this area is? Yeah. Oh, uh, right, yeah. Fans. Uh, this is Totter's Lane, for those that might know. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. This is the first uh, area that they ever had in the show uh, in the 1960s. Um, those stairs are uh, the same stairs. Um, so, this is the junkyard, basically, where the Doctor had his, well, had the TARDIS hidden in the very first episode. I mean, just seeing this, it just thinks, oh, this is the only puzzle that we created it, but actually um, this is version 2 of the junkyard. Mm. Version 1 was for the vertical slice, but we thought now it needs to be uh, more harder for gamers. They find more enjoyment making it where it's more difficult to discover where the satellite dish is or the battery and not just presented in front of them. Also that ties into the narrative of the TARDIS that kept appearing and reappearing in the area. Yeah. First Dalek ship. Oh, this was great, the first thing you said. This is using Nick Briggs as well, the, the voice of the modern day dialect. I had to go through about a thousand versions of that line to pick the right one. <laughs> How was it uh, writing dialogue for Nick Briggs to speak? Video? Um, <laughs> it was interesting. To be honest, it was mainly uh, Emma's lines that were writing. Well, mo most of the, the, the Dalek stuff was done. But he sent over a sound pack, which I think had just over a thousand broken up lines. So that exterminated. There was about 90 variations, I think. Do you guys remember those boxes on the right? Yeah, 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 definitely. I was going to say, George, do you remember that? Right? Yeah, remember the... I hadn't noticed until recently that that... When, when you sonic the boxes, when they pop into the air, I thought that was all scripted in timeline, animation. But you told me it was a recording of the oh, actual physics. Oh no, it's, it's a recording of the actual physics. So we had to make sure that it was always the same and it works on all platforms. So what I did is I played it uh, so the physics were running, but I recorded it as an animation. It's a nice little trick. Yeah, very cool. I didn't even know you could do Actually, that. the satellite dish is the same. The way it falls down, that's what it feels like it falls down naturally. The old bigger on the inside trick. Oh, that's that's very important to get in place. Nice escape from your long trip, mate. That's what I call a clean getaway. No? Oh well, see yourself. But hey, my TARDIS, Hydrox, a reality virus. Told you it was going to be amazing. But you slash. Now we've got to get on and somehow save all of creation. Right? This is going to be fun. Then getting a taste of the title sequence. This isn't the same title sequence as the current series. Um, 
helpful reasons being that when we first saw it, uh, it's full of fluid, dyma- <laughs> fluid dynamics, which uh, it's obviously not an easy thing to create in real time, let alone in VR. So we actually were able to speak to the BBC and design our own version, um, which is based off the time vortex. And actually, it's probably more enjoyable for players to go through just because it was harked back a little bit to the old style. I think it sequence. works really well in VR. It's really nice. Yep, so that's uh, Gavin Collinson, who's a writer who's worked on the show previously in sort of David Tennant years. So he was great fun to work with. Definitely brought the, the Who details to the game. This was one of the areas you spent a fair bit of time with early on, wasn't it, Joey? Oh, definitely. <laughs> it's also yeah, so the taste of seeing Jody performance, isn't it, in the game? Yeah, definitely. I mean, very early on, we knew that um, one thing we had to get right was get the TARDIS as accurate as possible. Um, like everyone else, we weren't able to see much of the TARDIS interior until it actually went on air. Um, I remember being on WhatsApp or something with people and there were various swear words going on from me when I first saw the interior. <laughs> it's just in terms of, oh my God, how much detail is there? Uh, are we going to be able to get this running in real time? Um, but thankfully we did. Um, so a part of the process for this was um, we had access to LiDAR scans um, from the interior, which create what is effectively point cloud data, lots of little dots. Uh, which make up a 3D scene. Um, I then spent time in Cardiff on set, taking photos, doing photogrammetry of various things, getting all the textures, um, even recording the sounds of every uh, dial or handle um, so that we get as close to the actual interior as possible. I remember you sending me videos while you was there saying, all right, Joey, you need to make sure that you turn the right direction <laughs> uh, with the same constraints. Like, okay, I'll promise I'll do that. <laughs> yeah, things that, oh, yeah, like they only turned uh, a quarter rather than some stuff which would turn full 360. So it's all quite important detail. I suppose it's the first time fans would actually get a chance to be inside the TARDIS properly. Um, so for me, that was one of the important, important factors of the game. It's quite strange, isn't it, when you're in there, or, I mean, you went to the set, um, but the scale's totally different to what you see compared to, like, the flat-screen TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got to remember everything is designed. Um, what, how people saw it when it was on, well, especially the previous series, um, the way they filmed it were always from very tight angles because it's actually quite a tight set. Um, I think they changed that for the most recent series. They had They changed the walls and things so they could reposition the camera throughout the whole thing um, but if it for a sort of experience for a person it actually works really well oops <laughs> I got that wrong to the release so we could uh, see the effects <laughs> obviously how about the easter egg under the dash oh yeah I'll save that one for all the players it's a very important part of the TARDIS oh, you're getting good at this not quite as fast as my PB, but you're knocking at the door. Well, you're approaching the porch. Driveway, call this at whatever. Right, you can actually just spot it there, bottom left corner of the screen. <laughs> The amount of interaction, I would say, uh, in one single place, this is probably the most needy. I mean, the, the egg timer, the, all the dials, the knobs, the levers, there's just quite a lot. And a, a nerdy fact, that sound effect of the TARDIS is actually uh, declared as a piece of music. Uh, rather than the sound effect, <laughs> which is actually owned by a record label. 
you didn't get to see them, but the doors were flashing as well when the TARDIS was, was um, oh, yes, sound effects. Right, yeah. That was done quite late, and it wasn't a Jira task. Remember, a couple of people weren't happy about that being slipped in. <laughs> That's yeah, alright, I think if it managed to make it in, it makes it better, it's good. Yeah. Sometimes you got to go rogue. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we're making our way to the first main level. I love this moment when you walk out. Those are the actual locks. Um, I do have the number for them on Screwfix, if anyone wants to buy those. Once again, yeah. Big on the inside moment. It never gets old, does it? Our first introduction to our main character, Emma. I mean, creating a forest is quite challenging because when you create something so open, players just want to go everywhere. Mm. So trying to keep that tight knit and making sure that they see the important stuff is hard. It's also just the idea of this was to feel like you're in a forest but then drop subtle hints and clues that you might be somewhere unexpected <laughs> after all. I can't remember if you can hear about the camp music. Um, was the same one that we used in the laundry, but slower down. But we took it out, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, this tent. Do you remember the issue with the tent, Joey? <laughs> no, remind me. <laughs> the whole cloth thing. Ah, oh, the cloth dynamics. Oh, it was quite expensive, so we had to take that out, to be honest. But you could actually interact with all of the dynamics and just move things out of the way. It was really cool. You know, this level by far was the hardest to um, to optimize in terms of the occlusion culling. Mm. There's no door. Definitely. Yeah, there's no doors, corridors. You just have a constant view of ahead and behind. It's really tricky. Oh, is this another Joey moment? This didn't put in. <laughs> <laughs> we had some of it isn't it? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> the scream. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it catches most people out. Still does me most days. I remember when I was like working on these little things, I worked silently. And I said, okay, here's a new prototype. And it's just people like working and then suddenly hear little screams. I think, okay, they've seen that new bit. <laughs> Don't hang around too long. Those things know you're here. Starting to introduce elements of technology into the forest. So the characters in here, is there any like background story to them, Marcus? Uh, it's kind of explained in the in the game, but they were uh, previous people that used to live on board. Whoops! Oh, <laughs> another Jerry, <laughs> Jerry jump scare. Like it should be your middle name, Jerry. Um, yeah, they were previous uh, people that lived, um, but became feral. Um, over time because of something else that you've not met yet. Oh. These cables which probably shouldn't be pink. I'm not sure what version I'm playing on, but it looks like they're full of energy, so that's okay. <laughs> it's so part of the whole thing. thing. Yeah. <laughs> this is again another 
a new version of this original puzzle. Um, they say that the clues, at least for the prototype, they used to be presented in front of you on different sides of a piece of paper. But trying to create uh, in-world items that would work with that floating piece of paper wouldn't work. Uh, so you came up with another idea to draw them on the walls. Yeah, it might have been someone who was, uh, who's now become one of those creatures, previously had knowledge or uh, were an engineer, so knew how to operate this thing, but wrote it down. Yeah, I think Adil was tasked to basically come up with this new idea, wasn't it? Like putting on the walls and stuff. Yeah, the first, well, there was a bit of a difficulty with Spike first when uh, the actual pegs didn't have any lights on them. So we had to mm. kind of brighten those up as well and come up with an alternative to the floating piece of debris. Quinn had a lot of trouble with that, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> Why is there a big metal thing in a forest? Wow. About to find out. Always being watched. <laughs> <laughs> Near the end here, I had a bug that lasted a good five weeks, I think. It was a back and forth where one of the QA guys could constantly jump out of the lift here and go back into the forest. <laughs> he doesn't want to go down, <laughs> yeah. clearly. Oh, I love this bit coming up. Um, it's one of my favorite pieces of music that was written for the game. Oh, the lift sting. Yeah, the whole, oh. the whole lift sequence with the music, I loved it. The way it was pulled on the screen. I think I've always had a thing about technology in forests, probably shows like Lost, uh, which I was a huge fan of. <laughs> um, <laughs> things that shouldn't be there being present. Oh, so this is basically the hatch from Lost. <laughs> yeah, but in space. Yeah, <laughs> an inside out hatch. It's a very cool moment. So yeah, the forest is actually on board a ship. We're not on a planet at all. This actually lift sequence, we, did we have to extend it at least a few metres last, last minute or something? Yeah, I think so. It was like it was over too quickly, so we had to quickly extend it. Yeah, I think it pauses right at the beginning as well. Mm. Alright, Joe, you're going to get name dropped in a minute. <laughs> Is it Joey Jumpscare? No, no, I'll put your name in some of the dialogue. <laughs> Just as placeholder, and it's stuck, stuck there for a year. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's placeholder when it's my name. <laughs> Oh, that was quite difficult. Um, when I was creating like the whole level design, I wanted to do it in such a way where it's like interesting for the player. We got turns and twists, and not just straight corridors. But that also had to make sense in terms of the physical scale and the physical dimensions of the ship. This is probably the peak of, let's say, the challenges in the game. We did have a, another name for this puzzle, didn't we? But we had to take it out for reasons. <laughs> you can mention it. Yeah, what was it called, Adil? What did you name it? It was called the Nostromo puzzle. But yeah, the Nostromo maze. Yeah. This was uh, fat fans. That Ooh. is actually my back uh, when I had an MRI scan, when I had a Whoa. very bad back. I didn't know that. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, luckily it doesn't still look like that. No, <laughs> only a little bit. <laughs> I mean, putting this together, uh, I remember I was speaking to the lead program, Neil. How can you make something really complex uh, that required like three, four rooms to solve one thing? And trying to put this together, making lasers bounce around with mental. Yeah, this was such a pain in, um, for the narrative. Because every time I wanted to go in there and test it, I had to solve this puzzle. And we didn't know the shortcut. 
for a good three or four weeks. Yeah, this there's probably a point here where I pause briefly because I'm trying to remember how to do the quick way of doing this. And I'm actually texting Joey and Adele because I can't remember it. <laughs> Otherwise, we'd be on this bit of video probably for about half an hour because I always struggled. Yeah. There's no shame. It is definitely one of the hardest puzzles yeah. here. It is the hardest puzzle in the game, to be honest. Uh, this was actually toned down as well. It was like another tier harder uh, just mm. before release. Yeah, when the rotation right. smaller before. It was. It would rotate every 15 or so degrees. Um, then I just doubled them up. Okay, this is where you're texting me the solution. Right. <laughs> Got it. Okay, so resetting the puzzle. Nice. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Shortcut. We can cut that bit out, it makes it look like you did it by yourself. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Be too much of a simpleton. And funny enough, that was one of the things that people totally forget sometimes in VR that you can just take some item, put it back in another room, but it, it goes past people and it ends up being a hurdle. When you quite, you know, when you think about it, it's actually quite an easy solution. Should be it. There we go. Power is restored. But are you brave enough to go down there? You're almost there. The bridge isn't too far ahead. I'm starting to get this weird. I've always had a thing about zero G objects. Oh, oh that's always fun, isn't it? Famous Leicesters. So these were very much based off modern reality TV stars. <laughs> very much the sort of the Love Island mentality of perfection. Just reading the dialogue is quite difficult to get your head around like three, four, or five people talking over each other. How difficult was it to put together, Adil? Yeah, this was the first cutscene that I worked on, and all the sound files were just labelled with numbers, so it was really tricky distinguishing um, each Leicester from each other in the first place. Um, we had to do a few subtle things to make sure it was clear who was speaking. So, Mark, do you remember brightening the faces up and yep. kind of blacking out the others? Came out quite nicely, though. So, some some great environment art there from our good friend Andreas, who helps us out with a lot of the hard surface stuff in the game. This was um, one of the things that we had to reevaluate, isn't it? We had another laser puzzle at the sequence mm. um, to repair the lift. Uh, but at the time we thought it would be best to take it out for many reasons and one of them being that after that bigger laser puzzle is a bit too much for the player to pile on um, so it's kind of moments like calm down you did it you've restored all systems I'm giving to a lot of I will say everything about buttons lots of flashing buttons and that comes from a love of the what was it the Disney movie the Black Hole? Oh, I love Black Hole. Yeah. An early sci-fi. It's pretty cool, actually. It's definitely worth a rewatch. Definitely Way before it's time. <laughs> I've seen a trailer. 
Oh, are you going to try and control it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we originally had a whole, well, plan to do a moving control game as part of this sequence. There's quite a lot of polygons in those sticks, actually. Because I knew people were going to play a bit, so yeah. I guess they had to provide it. <laughs> I remember when the first time we get into this level and the buttons weren't flashing, it was felt so boring, isn't it? But as soon as we got that working, mm. just brought it alive. There's a lot of sprite sheets going on in this level. It's kind of a hark back to the sort of 70s way of thinking about sci fi with lots of buttons that look very complicated and you have no idea what they do. <laughs> It feels like everything these days is a, a UI hologram in sci-fi stuff. So I just wanted to keep it more in that 70s, almost alien aesthetic in places. This whole sequence was a lot of fun to make. Wow. Here's your introduction to a time crystal. Well, a yeah, very important part of the story. Yeah. I've managed to transmit the TARDIS into the main body of the ship. Go to it, now! Save yourself! There's no time to rescue me! But it's actually me performing as course. Emma, yeah? <laughs> you have a different voice too. Now go. Yeah, yeah. Before Very you go, talented. Quickly, Sonic the emergency life support system. The panel with the flashing lights. Quickly! Goodbye! That was a kindness. No, you haven't got much time to escape. You see the shadows, the, the ship's now turning. And get back to the TARDIS. You know, collision course. Taking us down to the planet. I remember this was one of the very last things that I had to put together. I wasn't, we wasn't sure how it was going to be done. Yeah. Um, we just spent like a good week of planning this out to see what would be realistic in VR. Mm. How does it feel like when you know, things are tearing apart like, you know, next to you? Thank goodness there's a TARDIS there to escape with. Yeah. Oh, it's nice seeing that, isn't it? Feels like home, doesn't it? Yeah. And I think that brings us to the end of our current playthrough. Um, so yeah, so that's just the first opening chapters of the game. Um, I think that's all we have time for today. Um, it's a slight bit of seeing a side times. Um, so yeah, um, I say thank you very much for joining us. Um, that's quite nice to look back at what we've done a, a while back now. Um, so thank you to Jerry. Yeah, uh, thanks for like, like, listening and I hope you guys pick up the game. I mean, there's so much more uh, to see and play so you can experience the rest for yourself. <laughs> and um, thank you to Adil as well. Yeah, thanks guys for listening. It's actually really nice going back and seeing everything we've done. Nostalgia pouring in there. Definitely. Um, yeah, it was a great fun project to work on. So, um, yeah, c hope you guys get to enjoy it. And, um, yeah, keep an eye out for future news coming from the studio. There might be a few interesting things coming up on the horizon. 
Um, thank you very much. Cheers, guys. See ya. Bye. See ya.